Hello. Uh, this is quite awkward now because, like, Russell's got you into a state of orgiastic splendour and then brought on Mr. Potato Head. Uh, so, uh, so I was watching. I've been watching the Winter Olympics actually, and it was a couple of months ago now. And the opening ceremony, I thought it was absolutely brilliant, right? Because in the opening ceremony, they get all the different countries to kind of parade through the stadium, right? And I think the first country they invited to parade through was a Scandinavian country like Norway, someone who's really good at winter sports, right? So they were like, "Please welcome Norway," and all the Norwegians like big cheesy grins, like big waves walking through the stadium, and then. A little later on, they invited the British to parade through. Obviously, we're less good at winter sports as well and slightly less confident, but still trying to put a brave face in it. So it's like, Britain! And the Brits were like... <laughs> and then the commentator, he did a wonderful thing, right? He said, and now, please put your hands together, making their very first appearance at the Winter Olympics. It's Ghana! <laughs> it was just one fucking guy, right? <laughs> He looked as if he'd been tricked into going. <laughs> Poor fucker's never even seen snow before. <laughs> now finds out he's the captain of the luge team. <laughs> I was actually, I was, I was watching the luge and I thought, like, how, how can this get any more ridiculous? And then the announcer said, the next competitor, Mr. Manuel Fister. <laughs> That's the name that cuts you out free for a career in extreme sports or extreme pornography. <laughs> well, I guess if my surname was Fister and my parents had christened me Manuel, I'd be quite keen to repeatedly throw myself down a bloody mountain on a tea tray. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't all fun either, like the Winter Olympics. Like, um, a guy actually got killed um, doing the luge on the very first day of the Winter Olympics during the training run. Uh, and also, uh, something happened in, in the United States it took a lot of people by surprise, uh, but not me, though. Uh, a woman in the US, she got killed uh, by a killer whale. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't really that shocked by that. <laughs> I was like, it's a killer whale. That's kind of what they do, isn't it? I mean, you could hardly accuse him of acting out of character. <laughs> I thought I'd do a bit of research, you know, into killer whales, like, to find out more about them. And, and what I discovered is, um, usually, killer whales, they live in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't do that much research. Uh, <laughs> they live in the sea, right? Which is really big. <laughs> and what these Americans have done is, they've taken the killer whale out of the sea, which is really big. <laughs> Put it into a pool, which is really small. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I can kind of understand that, right? I imagine, like, if I went to Africa, to the Serengeti, right, and grabbed myself a lion, <laughs> and then went home and locked it in my shed. <laughs> Next time I open the shed door, I imagine this year lion's gonna be pretty fucking agitated. <laughs> they came up with more facts as well. They said, this killer whale has killed before. <laughs> the killer whale had already killed two other people, right? Technically making it a serial killer whale. <laughs> this killer whale is three times as dangerous as a pool party around Michael Barrymore's house. <laughs> I'm not saying he did it, just that he's a bad host. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find myself in a good mood, you know, I kind of... I, I know we're out of the recession now, right? And, but people still talk about the recession and the effects of the recession. You still see it on the TV as, like, Britain's longest ever recession, you know? It's a record-breaking recession. It's the longest recession Britain's ever faced, right? I'll be completely honest with you. The only difference I've noticed during the recession is now we've got adverts on the television asking us to send in any spare gold we've got. <laughs> As if I've got shitloads of gold around the house. Why am I finding it so difficult to walk? <laughs> That's right, I'm way down with all these nuggets and ingots. <laughs> I never realised there was money to be made in gold before. <laughs> I 
love those adverts, right? Because they're all there's so many different companies, right? But they all follow the same basic template, yeah? Like the guy comes on the television, right? And he goes, it's really simple. It's really simple, yeah? Step one. I'm already thinking this is getting far too complicated. <laughs> then again, it is two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm sat on my sofa in my pants, <laughs> waiting for the second half of Loose Women to commence. <laughs> I'm up for hearing a business proposition. What's your plan, Dale Winton? <laughs> Lay it on me. <laughs> First of all, step one, get together all of your goals. As if you've got a lot of goals <laughs> and you keep it in various separate locations. <laughs> now is the time to reunite all of your goals. <laughs> Step one. Step two. Pop it into an envelope. <laughs> a bloody envelope, right? You've taken it out of the relative security of the safe, which is made out of metal. And now they tell you to put it inside this flimsy paper container. <laughs> Step two. Step three. Write all my goals <laughs> on the front of the envelope. <laughs> Just in case there's any postman thinking to himself, well, there's definitely a heavy metallic element <laughs> in this envelope, but it doesn't say gold on the front, you know. I wouldn't want to illegally open it and then find myself a shitload of copper. <laughs> I've been burnt in the past. <laughs> Step four, just drop it into a post box. I'll be honest with you, like the recent problems with the Royal Mail, I'm not even trusting those fuckers with letters. <laughs> Let alone any precious metals I've got. That, that is why they were known as the Free Wise Men, yeah? Because they took their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh and they hand-delivered them in person, yeah? Rather than sending them ahead on a bloody recorded donkey, <laughs> crossing their fingers and hoping for the best. Yeah. It, re it really annoys me, like, just even trying to, like, post a letter. Like, I, I was trying to post a letter about a week ago, right? So the only thing I wanted to do was to send this letter first class, right? So I queue up for ages. Eventually, I get to the front of the queue. There's a guy behind the counter. I said to him, excuse me, mate. I'd just like to send this, please. First class. He goes, all right. He takes it off me, he goes, uh, is it anything important? <laughs> As if I'm gonna go, oh, actually, <laughs> no. <laughs> to be honest with you, this is just scrap paper I'm trying to get rid of. <laughs> Yeah, at the moment, I am busy saving up for a shredder. <laughs> and so far, this is the best way I've discovered about how to get rid of this shit. <laughs> so I, I, I went home to uh, visit some friends and family, and do you ever get that where you might go out with a bunch of people on a night out and someone else is in charge, and then they take you to a pub where you might not necessarily normally frequent? I ended up in, in a pub called uh, Weatherspoons. Um, <laughs> do you know Weatherspoons? <laughs> I kind of look at Weatherspoons as less of a place to drink and more a kind of bizarre social experiment. Because <laughs> I think there's only really three groups of people who drink in the Weatherspoons, right? First group, real ale enthusiasts. They're there because there's a wide variety of real ale on top and they don't play any loud music, right? Second group, students. They're there because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that alcohol is quite competitively priced, right? <laughs> and then the third group I like to call full-blown elbow-bending alcoholics. <laughs> they are just there because there's alcohol there, right? Now, the interesting thing is, neither of the groups get on <laughs> with either of the other two groups. And also, there's a kind of widespread mistrust and paranoia about the place, because nobody is quite sure how come everything is so cheap. <laughs> I, was having, I was having a horrible time in this weather soon, so I, re I really wasn't enjoying myself. And I was pushed up against the window, right, in a, in a really foul mood, and I saw something through the window, 
that changed my mood. It kind of lifted my spirits a bit, right? I'll explain what I saw through the window. Um, there, there was a fight. Um, <laughs> there was a fight outside in the street. Now, I should point out to you, right, normally violence makes me really nervous and uncomfortable. I don't like any kind of physical aggression, right? I just hate it, right? This fight, however, slightly different in that every single one of the participants in the fight happen to be in fancy dress. <laughs> it sort of negated the brutality of the fight, right? And also helped cheer everyone up a bit. I'll explain what I saw through the window. It's absolutely true as well, right? Um, six men fully dressed as umpa lumpers. <laughs> uh, they, they'd gotten the full lumper as well. Uh, they had uh, orange faces and, and green wigs and they had uh, um put up to the maximum, and uh, they were uh, repeatedly and quite viciously kicking the shit <laughs> out of one man who's lying on the ground who is dressed entirely and accurately as a thunderbird. <laughs> Actually, I say entirely and accurately, that's not strictly true. I mean, he had his stash on, but his little hat had fallen off. Uh, <laughs> In the beating, but then you're not expected to maintain full costume composure uh, under such a flurry of kicks and punches. Uh, winning the fancy dress competition, now a very distant memory for him, replaced by just trying to protect his face. And I was kind of transfixed. I was kind of watching this through the window, right? And it's the first time in my life I've ever gone nearer a fight rather than further away from a fight. I actually grabbed some friends in the pub and said, look, we've got to go outside and watch this. It's brilliant. <laughs> we went outside and there's already a group of people forming, watching the fight, and we kind of joined them. And as we joined them, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a very drunk gentleman stumbling down the street, right? He's trying to make his way home. He's completely trousered, this guy, right? He's, he's kind of all over the shop. He gets level with a fight. Stops. <laughs> He takes one look at the Thunderbird, another look at the Umpa Lumpers, and then just turned to the rest of the crowd and just went, those bastards! They've cut his strings! Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I've been Lloyd Langford. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>